Hello and welcome to another video and if you haven't already do please like and subscribe uh, it's a big help. Uh, today in this video I just want to talk about two books that I recently finished that are bum 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 bum, uh, Path to Paradise and The Big Goodbye. They're both by the same author Sam uh, Wasson, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I really enjoyed them and I thought it might be fun just to make a video uh, talking about what I've learned about them. So here we go. So first up is The Big Goodbye, a book about the making of the 1974 film Chinatown. Chinatown is kind of many things to many different people, but uh, it, to the author it kind of represents the artistic high of a period of American cinema that went roughly from 1968 with Bonnie and Clyde to kind of Jaws, which would have been a turning point of American cinema in 1975. And uh, he really lauds Chinatown as the kind of artistic peak of that period and you know in watching the movie and especially in reading the book it's easy to understand why he uh, he feels that uh, so you meet uh, its director to be Roman Polanski its writer Robert Town its star Jack Nicholson and its uh, producer Robert Evans um, so uh, so you see their kind of individual journeys up to the start of 70s and then their convergence into making uh, this film. In doing this, in kind of talking about the people who were involved in it and really going into their histories, um, he's, uh, Wasson is kind of showing that he doesn't just want to do a simple production of the film. He's interested in the people who made the film. He's interested in learning about them, uh, their history, and what the film ultimately meant to them on their journey. So of all those uh, key people who are in the book, I probably knew the least about Robert uh, Town, the writer. But it was interesting to learn about Robert Town, and the m most surprising thing, which I didn't know about, was that actually there was another person helping him write the script. Uh, someone that he referred to as his editor in the book, quote unquote editor. Uh, called Edward Taylor. And the book really goes into great uh, detail of um, of how Town did come up with the original idea of doing a detective story basing it on the water and where Taylor comes in is kind of in helping Town work out the mystery of the novel, working out the beats, working out where to start and where to go to. And some of those chapters uh, and paragraphs were some of my favourites in the book. Upon closer inspection, Town and Taylor weren't simply navigating a bounty of subplots but a cache of backstories. Central problem I have, Town noted to himself, is with constant business of going into the past. How to keep from that? He answered his own question. Try to keep the action ongoing. Simple. Early in October 1971, Town and Taylor attempted to reduce and combine their separate novelistic explorations of world, story and character into the sparest outlines. It was Eddie, Payne would say, who got Robert to write his first outline. He wouldn't outline before Chinatown. If you've never heard of uh, Edward Taylor, don't be surprised, I don't think anyone had. Uh, there's no record of him on IMDb, uh, and even the Wikipedia page just has a little kind of uh, appendage that looks like it was recently added. And of course the book then talks of when Polanski comes in and how Polanski could have got a credit but he didn't, and you know, um, when someone asked him why he didn't arbitrate for a credit on the movie, Polanski said, because Robert Town was my friend. Uh, and Polanski was obviously hugely respons responsible for changing the ending of the movie as well. It's always, str it's always been strange to me that Town and maybe Taylor had this kind of happy ending of where Evelyn Mulray and her daughter, sister, could go over the border and live kind of happily ever after. Uh, Robert Town always says that, said that Chinatown was about the futility of good intentions, uh, which is just a great expression. But if it is about the futility of good intentions, how can you have this happy ending? And it was very much Polanski uh, who came in and said, no, it has to be a tragedy. Uh, a tragedy will have the most impact on the audience. And you do definitely get a sense watching the ending that, yeah, you have been traumatized by that shocking ending. And maybe it takes a European uh, to come in there and do that. Uh, someone who has survived the Holocaust, someone who has survived the Sharon Tate uh, 
uh, uh, the Manson murders to come in and do that and say no it has to have a tragic ending so the other great thing about the book is that it, it, it does go into the day by day running of the film and you can see the the impact of those the impact that the that the choices and and uh, decisions that were made on a day by day day by day basis how they impacted the film and um, like you can see in the orange groves sequence how the footage changes from a much kind of um much kind of what i would call grainier and kind of um higher contrast uh footage to the much cleaner footage that we have in the rest of the film and it talks about how the DOP was sacked after the first couple of days uh, after the Orange Grove sequence just because he was taking up too much time. It goes into episodes that, you know, most of us probably already know, like when Polanski pulled out the hair that was catching the light from Faye Dunaway's head and she screamed and ran away into her trailer. But there's also smaller episodes which I'd never heard of as well, like uh, Robert Evans trying to dye the footage red. Uh, as a kind of an experiment <laughs> yeah so that was interesting as well and uh, that's all really fascinating and if you're a film person like me a film nerd like me those are the kind of details that you want you want to feel like you're there on the set day by day and uh, there's so many great stories uh, and if what just comes across is that they're all friends and they all had a great time making this film together so the other book that I read is the Path to Paradise by Sam uh, Wasson. Um, what has in common with uh, The Big Goodbye is that both books are obviously about uh, America, 1970s uh, cinema, um, and the people who made those movies. But while Chinatown, while The Big Goodbye focuses on Chinatown, uh, Coppola's book uh, focuses not just on one film, but a number of films and a number of decades uh, as Coppola goes from essentially the rain people to Megatropolis um, and his production company Zoetrope and how Zoetrope changes kind of shape as Coppola's luck ebbs and flows throughout the decades. Um, I love the book and it was great to read more on Coppola and it felt m a very great definitive book on Coppola that was much more true to who Coppola was, you know. Coppola doesn't look at his career through the lens of the Godfather movies, you know. Um, but unfortunately, so many biographies do. But this book really looks at Coppola through the lens of an independent artist that just happens to work in cinema. That's how I've always looked at him, you know. You watch any of those movies and the first thing that comes across is the shocking, uh, you know how different every movie is, not just to the movie he made before it, but also to mainstream American movies uh, that were being made at the time. And that's worked for and against Coppola at the time. Um, the Godfather was obviously shocking in its realism and people had never seen um, that kind of natural acting style in the kind of mafia movie, which would be outdated. Um, but it also worked against Coppola when you look at films like Rumblefish and the Outsiders and you know it has that great quote by Evans or that great kind of uh, mention about Evans who was shocked when he saw Rumblefish and he was shocked how far Coppola had gone and when you think of 1980s cinema you don't think of Rumblefish you don't think of the Outsiders you think of you know commercial movies like Alien, Star Wars um, so Coppola was always a con always at contrast with his surroundings and it's worked for and against him and the book is very much him going on that uh, journey. So what's great about the book and what I loved is that it really went into, one, into great detail into the making of what would be defined as one of Coppola's uh, flops if you want to look at it unfortunately from the box office point of view. Uh, and it spends over a hundred pages which is about a quarter or almost a third of the book going into this film which is not Apocalypse Now, not The Godfather but One From The Heart. One From The Heart is the 1980 film that Coppola made uh, directly after Apocalypse Now and what Wasson seems to be saying is that to understand Coppola and to understand his journey you kind of have to understand the destination 
and one from the heart was the destination that Coppola arrived at at the end of the 70s. Um, and what really comes across in that destination, in those 100 pages, is just how heady a journey uh, Coppola must have gone on from the rain people, uh, made independently with a couple of friends driving around the country on very low budget, to uh, one from the heart, 10 years later, more or less. Uh, having bought and owned a studio and making this film um, and just that journey how how intoxicating it must have been and this portion of the book is is key and is absolutely fascinating to read and you get incredibly uh, disparate figures appearing in these pages trying to come close to where uh, Coppola has arrived at which you know, so you get people like Lou Reed, Gene Kelly, uh, Jean-Luc Godard arriving at this studio that Coppola bought afterwards. I love the idea that after being out in the jungle and after being out of control in the jungle uh, and being outside, 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 Coppola tries to come back indoors to get control of the project, but real, but kind of maybe realizing or not realizing that the chaos from the jungle has followed him back here and all these people who Coppola wanted there, like Kelly, like Reed, like Godard, who wanted there, he, he wanted them there with the best of intentions, um, in this desire to create a kind of artistic community where people could live together and make work together and create a kind of utopia, and that's where the title of the book comes, Path to Paradise, is that how incredibly irresponsible it is as money just flows away but the one regret that comes across in the book that Coppola seems to have throughout his, his career is that he didn't follow his intuition on that movie and it goes into how one from the heart he originally wanted that film to be like a live action version of cinema without cuts um, but his cinematographer Storaro and production designer Dean Tavalaires talked him into kind of building this big set and making a really big, much bigger budget movie than he originally intended. Um, and so the movie very much became dominated by the cinematography and production design. So the other lens through which this portion of the book can be analysed is uh, through the idea of a digital cinema. Less so the film itself, which was shot pretty conventionally on film stock, but more so the manner in which Coppola was trying to make the film. Uh, by directing his actors from a mobile command studio uh, with a radio uh, and an intercom and also the idea of creating uh, previs uh, drawings and animations which would help uh, pre-visualize, pre-conceptualize how the film uh, would or could look and what angles they could use before the film uh, would be made and the idea being that you would save time because you would have already had a look at how the films would be made and Coppola um, had new technology and new computers that he put into the swordfish that allowed him to do this and some of this was of course a reaction to the wilderness and chaos of Apocalypse Now trying to control the situation but um, this was 1979, 1980 this kind of technology, uh, digital cinema, wouldn't be embraced for another 20-25 years. Um, so it was very much ahead of its time. And that seems to create, have created uh, a lot of misunderstanding and uh, between Coppola and the actors and through the crew. And it's been misconstrued at times in other books, especially Peter Biskin, Easy Rider, kind of um, phrasing, uh, framing Coppola as the famous actor who was now uh, uh, the famous actor's uh, director who was now uh, retreating into his trailer. Um, but in reality, Coppa, Coppola, yeah, he loved actors. He loved working with theatre and loved having close relationships with actors. But he was also the kind of the boy scientist and he also loved experimenting. So this wasn't a retreat or a change. It was, it was pretty much a straight continuity from what had happened before. But as has for other kind of people's narratives being reframed as something that it wasn't. But um, he used it again in the following films in Rumblefish and Outsiders and it was a much, it seems to have been a much smoother um, 
production as he kind of got his hands on how to work that technology. Um, but that was all fascinating, you know, as someone who makes digital cinema, that is really, you know, uh, very much the origin um, of digital cinema in, in a lot of respects. And really, really fascinating to read all that. And that was also another reason of why I loved this section of the book so much. So yeah, that was a terrific book and I've really only finished reading the last couple of days, so I'm still processing it. But it's an incredible journey and just amazing that uh, through the chaos of the 70s and everything that Coppola went through, he could still produce four of the greatest movies ever made, you know, Godfather, Godfather 2, Conversation and Apocalypse Now. And it really does make me want to re-watch uh, One From The Heart, Outsiders and Rumble Fitch. I've always loved both of those movies. Um, but definitely read it. Uh, definitely read it. Would definitely recommend it. Where this side is better. Definitely recommend it. Um, and if you're interested in films, interested in making films especially, just Coppola's uh, ambition, his fearlessness. You know, he's like saying, let's spend our money. If you've got money, spend it. And that's kind of a revolutionary idea in a society that's so afraid of money and just wants to put everything in the bank. Um, and he's not afraid to gamble. And, you know, he says that if you don't gamble, you're, you're, you're not really being true to yourself and you're not making the work that you could be making. And all that is really inspiring and just really dangerous and intoxicating stuff. Cool, so that's the end of the video. So thank you for watching. These were the two books that I reviewed today. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, so I'd recommend them both, both of great qualities. Sam Wasson is a great writer. He writes both stories with an, a great elegance and respect for um, a great, you know, uh, a, a reverence for the films and a great respect for the people who, you know, gave their lives to make us, to give us those films. Do you know what I mean? Like you think of just those classics that came out with the cinema of, of 1970s, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching and um, see you in another video soon, hopefully. And like and subscribe, I'm looking at you.